Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Indizor Education. Um, we continue talking about heat as it's related to molecular movements. Uh, today's lecture is about the connection between temperature, pressure, pressure and volume of the ideal gas. Um, now, this lecture is part of the course called Physics 14, presented on unizor.com. Um, you might have uh, find, found this particular lecture somewhere else, like on YouTube or some other website. I do recommend you, however, to go to this website, to unizor.com, because every lecture uh, has a very detailed notes. All the lectures are um, uh, logically connected to each other and presented uh, in, in the set of uh, uh, menus. Um, plus, there are um, uh, exams for those people who would like to challenge themselves. Uh, plus, uh, there is a prerequisite course called Mass for Teens, which is definitely needed for, uh, for this course. This is very much theory-oriented, mass-oriented kind of a course of physics. Um, and uh, uh, unizor.com is completely free, no advertisement. Uh, you don't even have to, to, to sign in unless you would like to save your exams for your teachers or parents or whatever else. Okay, so we'll talk about the temperature, the pressure and the volume of ideal gas. Now, before that, let me um, uh, divert a little bit your attention back to what actually temperature is. Um, I did address this uh, issue in uh, another earlier lecture. Temperature is a macro characteristic of some kind of an object. Um, what's important is how we measure it. We measure it using the thermometers, different kinds of thermometers, but for the purposes of this particular lecture I'm talking about thermometers which are most frequently used in your day-to-day -day life, like for instance alcohol-based thermometer which measures the temperature um, uh, in the room or outside uh, the, the, the temperature outside the window, uh, or a mercury-based thermometer which is used to measure the temperature of the body, used to actually. <laughs> Nowadays there are some more advanced uh, um, instruments, but anyway just concentrate on the thermometer which measures temperature uh, of the air in the room. So it goes uh, uh, up and down on a certain scale. So basically we are relating the temperature in the room which we have already discussed as being very much connected to kinetic energy of the molecules, um, their uh, speed, uh, the more intense they're moving, the more intensely they bombard the surface of the thermometer which in turn bombards the um, the liquid inside the thermometer which in turn causes the inside molecules to start moving faster and that's what actually the process of equalizing temperature from the air molecules which are moving at certain speed with certain kinetic energy um, uh, of each of them through the walls of the thermometer to the liquid in the thermometer which also becomes more agitated um, or less agitated depending on what uh, exactly the difference of the temperature was in the beginning but eventually the um, kinetic energy average kinetic energy of the molecules of the air is equalized with average kinetic energy of the molecules inside the liquid and as we explained um, in one of the earlier uh, lectures, this more intense or less intense movement of uh, molecules inside the liquid of the thermometer causes uh, increasing or decreasing of the volume, and so the level of the liquid in the thermometer goes up on, uh, or down. And now all we need to do is just to properly mark um, uh, temperature on a certain scale. So, this is a very much, um, very brief explanation of how the temperature is measured. So, most importantly is that eventually the temperature of the thermometer and the, uh, or liquid inside the thermometer and the air, or any other object, whatever we are measuring, doesn't really matter. We can measure the temperature of the water in the river. Uh, so, they equalize. 
Now, what's also important is that if it's a, a closed system, uh, let's say you have um, an isolated aquarium with water, isolated, which means there is no outside energy coming in or going out, and now you insert the thermometer inside that aquarium. So there is no external source of energy, which means that whatever the kinetic energy existed before, maybe it was a little bit more in the water of the aquarium and a little bit less in the thermometer or vice versa. Eventually it equalizes but the total amount of kinetic energy remains the same because it's basically preserved. There is nothing outside, uh, there is no outside source of energy or consumer of energy. Now that means that measuring the temperature of the object actually changes the temperature of the object itself because now the energy of the object should really be somehow equalized with uh, energy of the thermometer. So if energy of the, uh, let's say, aquarium was greater, average kinetic energy of the molecule was greater, then it will heat up the thermometer to equalize, right? Which means certain amount of uh, energy will be transferred from aquarium to the thermometer or vice versa, depending on what is warmer. So measuring changes the temperature of the object which we are measuring. However, we have to always think about this as a non-important factor because in most of the circumstances uh, the energy uh, of the thermometer is really very small relative to the energy, um, the total energy of uh, uh, the all molecules uh, of the object whatever we are measuring in all our practical lives. I mean if it's not the case then obviously we should use different kinds of thermometers. But in our everyday life, again back to the measuring of the temperature of the, uh, of the room using a, a regular alcohol-based uh, thermometer, obviously it's negligible loss of energy whenever we are introducing thermometer into, into the room. So that's okay. I mean, we are changing, but not very significantly and negligent, ne negligibly, actually. Okay, now, what else? In one of the previous uh, lectures, we were talking about how um, the temperature is related to average speed. Now, in most, um, the most important um, uh, issue of that particular lec lecture was that um, if you're talking about um, molecules, they have certain speed, then the square of this speed is proportional to temperature um, if counted from absolute zero. Now, the temperature of absolute zero is, let's say, the temperature out in the outside, um, in the space uh, um, outside of any kind of a planetary system, uh, far from the stars. And in this case, the um, average kinetic energy speed, basically, of uh, all the molecules will be zero. So that's what absolute zero actually means. And that's why whenever we are talking about proportionality, we are talking about this uh, starting with zero and this starting with zero. So whenever we have an absolute zero temperature, uh, we will have um, no movement of the molecules of the object. Then, as the, uh, the as, as the speed of the molecules is increasing, then the the average of the squares um, of the speeds of all the molecules will be proportional to the um, level of uh, liquid in the theoretical thermometer, whatever is measuring this particular um, temperature. So that's very important. So this is an absolute temperature starting from zero, and this is velocity, uh, well, it's square, so it's basically speed um, averaging, uh, uh, averaging all the squares of the speeds um, throughout the whole molecules of the object. So this is very important. Now, at the same time, we can say that if our molecules are um, um, uh, of the same mass, then it's obviously uh, proportional to kinetic energy, average kinetic energy of all the molecules, because kinetic energy, as we know, 
is equal to mv squared over 2, right? So, it's very important right now to connect this and this. So, kinetic energy is proportional to the temperature. And again, we're talking about absolute temperature and kinetic temperature of, and, and kinetic uh, energy obviously also starting from zero whenever the speed of the molecules is zero. Now, um, obviously we are talking about um, something which we have already established. The scientists already um, established the scale of this uh, absolute temperature. It's uh, degrees of Kelvin where absolute zero means absolute zero. There is nothing negative. In the Kelvin scale there is no negative um, degrees as we have in Fahrenheit or Celsius. Now, so zero means uh, approximately uh, it's a minus 273 degree of Celsius. Now, um, and one particular degree is measured as in the case of Celsius, as one hundredth of the difference between the temperature of the freezing water and temperature of the boiling water. Uh, so these are degrees of Kelvin and that's how we measure the temperature. And the uh, kinetic energy obviously is measured in uh, uh, system C as uh, joules. So this is degrees of Kelvin and this is joules. Jo joules. And proportionality obviously means that there is some kind of a coefficient between them. But let's not talk about this right now. We will come to this a little bit later. Now, um, next, again, I will refer you to the previous lecture where we were connecting, where we were connecting two-thirds of kinetic energy, average kinetic energy. Let me forget about this and I will put average here. So E average means average kinetic energy of uh, molecules, where N is the number of molecules. And if we will divide it by volume, then we will have the pressure. Now, this is the result of the previous lecture, and I do refer you to refresh your memory if you don't remember this formula. So, it's very important to know that the pressure uh, on the walls of the reservoir, which contains gas, right now we're talking about the gas, uh, is equal to two-thirds of average kinetic energy times number of molecules. So, this is the total amount of energy, because this is average uh, per molecule, and this is number of molecules. So this is the total kinetic energy. So if you will divide it by volume, and coefficient is two thirds. Now it's obviously that the pressure should be proportional to the total energy, and it's also obviously that pressure should be inversely proportional to the volume, because if the same molecules which are moving moving with the same speed are uh, spread uh, in a bigger volume, obviously the bigger the volume, the less the pressure. Now, what's uh, also important is this coefficient, and I'm not talking about how I derived it. I derived it in the previous lecture. So, in this particular case, I'm just taking this as granted. And I can express it slightly differently. I can resolve it for average energy, which is equal to what? Uh, 3 seconds P times volume divided by N. So this is average as basically resolved from here. Okay? Now, I have already mentioned that it's proportional to absolute temperature. Right? So our purpose, purpose of this lecture is to connect temperature, pressure, and volume. Temperature, pressure, and volume. What is N? Well, that's not such an easy thing. And this number of molecules in the reservoir. How can we actually relate to this? Well, apparently it's not easy. However, here is what, um, what I can actually suggest you to do. Now, from this, let's just write it uh, over there, that the P 
times uh, volume divided by N P times volume divided by N is proportional to T. Coefficient doesn't really matter right now. It's too proportional. So that's what we have. Now we have to really find out what kind of proportionality we are talking about. Let me write it differently. K times, where K is some kind of a coefficient. T, e, t is uh, the temperature in uh, absolute, uh, absolute temperature in Kelvin's degree. Now P is the pressure, obviously we all know what it is, like newtons per square meter. N is the number of molecules in the reservoir and volume is again like cubic meters, whatever it's measured. All right, so we got that. Now let's talk about the ideal gas. And usually I'm not resorting very much to saying something like experiment shows, okay? But in this particular case, I have to do it. Here is what's important. Molecules of different gases are obviously different. Like hydrogen is different from oxygen and oxygen is different from carbon dioxide, etc. And obviously they have different masses, these molecules. Which means that since we are talking about kinetic energy as the most important characteristic related to the temperature, masses are important as well as the speeds. And by the way, we will determine the speed of the uh, molecules of oxygen traveling in the air as the result of this lecture, which is kind of an interesting to know what's the speed of molecules, how they really move. We will be able to do it. So, mass is important. Now, what's also important is that gases are such substance, gas is such a substance when molecules are small relative, uh, relatively to the distance between molecules in, in, in the gas. So they are really flying, uh, colliding with each other, but not very often. I mean, they do have a relative freedom of movement. Well, obviously, when they hit the, uh, um, the, the wall of reservoir, that's what creates the pressure, obviously. But at the same time, they are relatively freely moving. Now, what's important is that every molecule has certain weight. And, and here again, I'm resorting to our experiments. There are some theory and there are some experiments which leads us to certain knowledge about the molecular weight. So there is something which we call a unit of molecular weight, which was some time ago decided to be one twelfth uh, of the um, mass of the uh, carbon uh, atom. Now, in these units, we can measure the mass of all other molecules, smaller or bigger. And in this particular case, the molecule of um, um, hydrogen, which, is, which consists of two atoms of hydrogen. Um, we will talk about atomic structure of different uh, elements later on. But right now, just take it as a face value that the molecule of hydrogen consists of two atoms and each one atom is approximately one unit, approximately equal to one atom of hydrogen. So the mass of this would be two. It's called atomic unit of mass, all right? Atomic mass unit. Now the oxygen, which is also the molecule of oxygen, contains two atoms of oxygen. It's uh, 16 plus 16, it's 32. Now the chemical formula for um, carbon dioxide, um, which is 12 plus uh, 32, that's 44. So we do know the masses in, in, on a certain scale. Now, I don't know how really many molecules are in any particular reservoir, but to make experiments with the same number of molecules of different gases, I can do it. Because if I know that, for instance, this is molecular 
atomic weight, uh, atomic mass of uh, hydrogen, and this is atomic weight of uh, uh, oxygen. If I will take a mass of hydrogen to be one sixteenth of the ma mass of to, to to be sixteen times greater than mass of um, uh, oxygen which I take. So this is amount of hydrogen and I'm taking this mass of hydrogen. I can weight it in some way, right? I can, I can put it in a reservoir, right? And, and weight it. So the mass will be uh, proportional to the weight. Now, and I can take certain amount of uh, oxygen put in, in, in the reservoir of the same weight, let's say. And if I will be able to match that this mass of um, uh, 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 hydrogen uh, is, uh, if, my, if, if mass of hydrogen is 1 16th of mass of oxygen, again, mass of hydrogen is 1 16th of mass of oxygen, then the number of molecules will be the same. Right? Am I right or not? If I will take, if I will have the same number of molecules, then the total weight of hydrogen will be one sixteenth of total weight of oxygen. Okay, whatever I said before, that that's the right thing, right? Okay, so which means I can take two reservoirs, one with oxygen and one is hydrogen, or hydrogen and oxygen, whatever it is. Make sure that they have exactly the same number of molecules, and N and make experiments. So if my N1 is equal to N2, then I can say that I can make experiments with the same number of molecules. Now what happens is that if this is the same and volume 1 is equal to volume 2 and T1 is equal to T2, then as a consequence P1 is equal to P2. This is the result of the experiment. What does it mean? It, it, it means that all gases are behaving in a similar fashion. And that's why the concept of ideal gas actually came to being. Because people saw that different gases provided different, provided similar conditions, like the same number of molecules, uh, enclosed in, this, in, in the same volume reservoir under the same temperature, they have the same uh, uh, pressure on the walls. So these are experiments. Or experiment can be done differently. For instance, equalize the pressure and then uh, see the temperature. So it looks like all the gases really behave exactly the same thing. Which means this coefficient although it's different maybe for liquids in case of we're talking about liquids but in in case of gases this particular coefficient is relatively the same for all for all the gases i mean the difference probably will be so negligible we, we can't re really even detect it using our um, instruments so that's what's very very important which means that instead of having this, I will write KB, where KB is a constant uh, called the Boltzmann, Boltzmann's constant, Boltzmann, Boltzmann, I think that's how it's spelled. So it's a Boltzmann's constant. And it has specific value. And specific value I have to really get somewhere. 1.381 times 10 to the minus 23rd joules per degree of Kelvin. So this is a Boltzmann constant. It is a constant for gases. And that's why we have this particular equation which represents behavior of all the gases.
well, within certain limits, obviously. I mean, uh, there are, I know, some extreme temperatures or maybe extreme pressures or something like that where it's distorted. But again, for the purposes of, I don't know, physics of uh, 19th and 20th, beginning of the 20th century, you can assume it's a constant. We don't really go into extremes. Okay, so that's very important. Now, what follows from this is that average energy, as we were saying, it's three seconds of uh, P volume divided by N, which is equal to three seconds K B times temperature. Now, this is known. This we can measure. It's just a macro characteristic. So, using the macro characteristic, we can have the micro characteristic of the gas, the average kinetic energy of the molecules. And that's very, very important. You see, measuring something on a macro scale, having the constant basically, and just measuring the temperature in degrees of Kelvin we can find out the average energy of, uh, average kinetic energy of the, uh, of the molecules of the gas. Okay, fine. Now, what follows from this is that the P times volume divided by T is equal to KB times N. Now, what does it mean if you try to interpret it? Well, if you take certain amount of gas, which is a certain number of molecules of gas in the reservoir, then, then this is constant if we are changing one of these parameters, right? So no matter how we change these parameters, pressure, temperature, volume, if we are talking about the same amount of gas, then this pressure times volume divided by temperature is constant, because this is constant, because we don't change the number of molecules. So, for instance, if we have some kind of a cylinder, okay, and it has certain volume, right? For instance, it's fixed. And then we are uh, applying temperature, we are changing the temperature. Well, if we are changing the temperature while volume remains constant, then P should also change proportionally, because otherwise the whole thing will not be a constant. So if I uh, double the temperature, my pressure should be doubled. So if I heat it up from one degree, let's say from uh, 100 degree uh, Kelvin to 200 degree Kelvin, which means double my temperature. My pressure should also double. Okay? Whatever the gas is, doesn't really matter. And this has a specific uh, name, this particular law, that if the volume is constant, and um, if the volume is constant, it's, uh, uh, the, the law is, is, is called uh, the law of Gay-Lussac. So if my if my V equals constant volume, I mean, then P and T are proportional to each other. Then P divided by T equals constant. That's my first law. Now, at the same time, I can uh, establish another experiment. When I maintain, let's say, uh, the temperature, if my temperature is constant, and then changing the volume. How can it be done? Well, but for instance, we don't change temperature. Temperature is always the same. Temperature is constant. But I have some kind of a plunger here, whatever it is. So initially, it's in the upper position, and gas, are, uh, gas molecules are everywhere. But then I press it down. So if I, let's say, uh, um, uh, decrease my volume by factor of two. What happens with pressure? 
if my volume is increasing, temperature is constant, then my pressure should, my, my volume is decreasing, then the pressure should increase, right? So the uh, pressure times volume is constant. And finally, if my pressure is constant, if my pressure is constant, then volume divided by T should be constant, right? So this is Gay-Lussac law. Now, if temperature is constant, that's the Boyle-Marriott law. And this is the Charles law. So each of these laws were discovered separately. And later on, everything was combined into something which is kind of a combined law. The uh, pressure times volume divided by temperature for a particular amount of gas is constant. No matter how you change, you can change all three characteristics, by the way. But this product of uh, P times volume divided by T should be constant. All right, so these are three laws. And then I promise to uh, find the speed of the molecules of oxygen. Um, and that's how we will do it. So we will do it using this. And also, I know that the molecule of oxygen has mass. Again, I have to resort to some experiments, whatever it was provided. 5.31 times 10 to the minus 26 kilogram. That's mass of one, mole one molecule of oxygen. Now, knowing the mass, knowing temperature, well, let's say room temperature is like 20 degrees Celsius, which is 293 degrees Kelvin. Knowing uh, Boltzmann's constant, which is this one, I can establish my mv square average divided by 2. That's what kinetic energy, average kinetic energy is. So if I will multiply this times this times this, I will get average kinetic energy. Knowing the mass, I can derive average uh, speed and average speed then I will take the square root of that to get the speed and it happens to be 478 meters per second which is pretty fast so the molecules of oxygen in the air which we are breathing are moving with average speed 478. Well, maybe my calculation is not exactly correct. Somewhere around this number, between 400 and 500 meters per second. Obviously, it's all, it, we are not talking about a concrete molecule, and it, it can be faster or, or, or slower. This is very, very much around average, which is pretty fast. However, you have to take into consideration that as m molecules are moving, no matter how small they are, they're still colliding with, with each other. So the direction is changing. So that's why the molecules maybe are moving very fast, but it doesn't mean that the molecules are flying away from, from us somewhere else, or, or there is some kind of a significant wind. There is no wind unless there is a wind from outside. So if you are in a room, you don't feel this, because no matter how fast they are, it's still within certain... Uh, microscopic um, dimensions so you don't feel it as a as a wind but anyway that's interesting kind of a um, observation which we can which we can make using theory well not only theory we did use for instance the mass of oxygen which was determined completely outside of the scope of this uh, of this lecture and the, the Boltzmann constant which also was, was calculated somehow in any case Using pure theory, and this is very, very important thing. This is very, very important equations. This is dynamics of the ideal gas. So using this theory and certain experimental facts, we have derived to some very unexpected result about the speed of the molecules uh, of oxygen in the air, which we are breathing with. 
Okay, I do recommend you to read the notes for this lecture. They are on unisor.com. Um, notes basically contain exactly the same information, presented in a textbook-like uh, format. Um, and, uh, well, that's basically it. That's it. Thank you very much, and good luck.